it's getting late. Time for your story, I think. This is Christopher Lee. Welcome to Fireside Tales. Edgar Allan Poe's Black Cat. For the most wild, yet most homely narrative which I am about to pen, I neither expect nor solicit belief. Mad indeed would I be to expect it, in a case where my very senses reject their own evidence. Yet mad am I not, and very surely do I not dream. But tomorrow I die, and today I would unburthen my soul. From infancy, my tenderness of heart was even so conspicuous as to make me the jest of my companions. I was especially fond of animals and was indulged with a great variety of pets. In manhood, I derived from it one of my principal sources of pleasure. My wife, observing my partiality for domestic pets, lost no opportunity of procuring those of the most agreeable kind. We had birds, goldfish, a fine dog, rabbits, a small monkey, and a cat. A remarkably large and beautiful animal, entirely black and sagacious to an astonishing degree. Pluto, this was the cat's name, was my favorite playmate and attended me wherever I went about the house. Our friendship lasted for several years, during which my character, through the instrumentality of the fiend, intemperance, experienced a radical alteration. I grew moody, irritable, regardless of the feelings of others. I used intemperate language to my wife. I even offered her personal violence. My pets, of course, were made to feel the change in my disposition. I not only neglected, but ill-used them. For Pluto, I retained sufficient regard to restrain me from maltreating him. But at length, even Pluto began to experience the effects of my ill temper. One night, returning home much intoxicated, I fancied that the cat avoided my presence. The fury of a demon instantly possessed me. I took from my waistcoat pocket a penknife grasped the poor beast by the throat and deliberately cut one of its eyes from the socket. When I had slept off the night's debauch, I experienced remorse for the crime. But it was a feeble, equivocal feeling. The cat slowly recovered. The socket of the lost eye presented a frightful appearance, but he no longer appeared to suffer any pain. He went about the house as usual, but fled in at my approach. I was at first grieved by this evident dislike on the part of a creature which had once loved me, but this feeling soon gave place to irritation, and then came, as if to my final overthrow, the spirit of perverseness. The longing to do wrong for wrong's sake only urged me to consummate the injury I had inflicted upon the unoffending brute. I slipped a noose about its neck and hung it to the limb of a tree. Hung it, the tears streaming from my eyes and the bitterest remorse at my heart. That night, I was aroused from sleep by the cry, Fire! Fire. The whole house was blazing. It was with great difficulty that my wife and myself made our escape. The destruction was complete. On the day succeeding the fire, I visited the ruins. The walls, with one exception, had fallen in. 
This exception was a compartment wall against which had rested the head of my bed. About this wall, a dense crowd were collected, examining a particular portion with minute and eager attention. I approached and saw, as if graven in bar relief upon the white surface, the figure of a gigantic cat. There was a rope about the animal's neck. The cat had been hung in a garden adjacent to the house. Upon the alarm of fire, this garden had been filled by the crowd, by one of whom the animal must have been cut from the tree and thrown through an open window into my chamber, probably with the view of arousing me from sleep. The falling of other walls had compressed the victim into the fresh plaster, the lime of which had then, with the flames, accomplished the portraiture. Although I thus accounted for the startling fact, for months I could not rid myself of the phantasm of the cat. I went so far as to regret the loss of the animal and to look for another. One night as I sat in a den of more than infamy, my attention was drawn to some object reposing upon one of the immense hogsheads of gin or rum. It was a black cat, a black cat, a gigantic cat. This cat had a large, indefinite splotch of white covering the breast. When I prepared to go home, the animal evinced a disposition to accompany me. When it reached the house, it domesticated itself at once. I soon found dislike arising within me. Its evident fondness for myself, disgusted and annoyed. By degrees, these feelings rose into the bitterness of hatred. I avoided the creature. Gradually, I came to look upon it with loathing. What added to my hatred of the beast was the discovery the morning after I brought it home that, like Pluto, it also had been deprived of one of its eyes. Its partiality for myself, however, seemed to increase. Whenever I sat, it would crouch beneath my chair or spring upon my knees, covering me with caresses. If I arose to walk, it would get between my feet and nearly throw me down. My wife had called my attention more than once to the white hair which constituted the sole visible difference between the strange beast and the one I had destroyed. This mark had been indefinite, but by slow degrees it had assumed a distinct outline. It was now the representation of an object that I shudder to name, of a hideous, of a ghastly thing, the gallows. I was wretched. Neither by day nor by night knew I the blessing of rest. During the former, the creature left me no moment alone, and in the latter, I started from dreams of unutterable fear to find the hot breath of the thing upon my face, from the ungovernable outbursts of a fury to which I now abandoned myself. My uncomplaining wife was the most usual and the most patient of sufferers. One day, she accompanied me upon some household errand into the cellar of the old building which our poverty compelled us to inhabit. The cat followed me down the stairs and, nearly throwing me headlong, exasperated me to madness. Uplifting an axe, I aimed a blow at the animal which would have proved fatal, but this blow was arrested by the hand of my wife. Goaded into a rage more than demoniacal, I withdrew my arm from her grasp and buried the axe in her brain. She fell dead upon the spot. I set myself forthwith to the task of concealing the body. I could not remove it from the house without the risk of being observed by the neighbours. I thought of cutting the corpse into fragments 
and destroying them by fire. I deliberated about casting it in the well. Finally, I determined to wall it up in the cellar. The cellar walls had lately been plastered throughout with a rough plaster. Moreover, in one of the walls was a projection caused by a fireplace that had been filled up and made to resemble the rest of the cellar. I could readily displace bricks, insert the corpse, and wall the hole up so that no eye could detect anything suspicious. By means of a crowbar, I easily dislodged the bricks, and having carefully deposited the body against the inner wall, I propped it in that position, while with little trouble, I relayed the whole structure as it originally stood. When I had finished, the wall did not present the slightest appearance of having been disturbed. My next step was to look for the beast. I had resolved to put it to death. But it appeared that the crafty animal, alarmed at the violence of my previous anger, had fled the premises. My happiness was supreme. The guilt of my dark deed disturbed me but little. Some inquiries had been made, but these had been readily answered. Upon the fourth day of the assassination, a party of police came into the house and proceeded to make rigorous investigation of the premises. Secure in the inscrutability of my place of concealment, I felt no embarrassment. The officers bade me accompany them. They left no nook or corner unexplored. At length, they descended into the cellar. My heart beat as calmly as that of one who slumbers in innocence. The police satisfied, prepared to depart. I burned to say but one word by way of triumph, and to render doubly sure their assurance of my guiltlessness. Oh, by the by, gentlemen, I said as the party ascended the steps, this is a very well-constructed house. In the rabid desire to say something easily, I scarcely knew what I uttered at all. These walls are solidly put together. Here, through mere bravado, I tapped heavily with a cane upon that very portion of the brickwork behind which stood the corpse of the wife of my bosom. No sooner had the reverberation of my blows sunk into silence, and I was answered by a voice from within the tomb. A cry, at first muffled and broken, like the sobbing of a child, and then quickly swelling into one long, loud, continuous scream. A wailing shriek, half of horror and half of triumph, such as might have arisen only out of hell. Swooning, I staggered to the opposite wall. For one instant, the party upon the stairs remained motionless. In the next, a dozen stout arms were toiling at the wall. The corpse, greatly decayed and clotted with gore, stood before the spectators. Upon its head, with red extended mouth and solitary eye of fire, sat the hideous beast whose informing voice had consigned me to the hangman. I had walled the monster up within the tomb. These fireside tales are abridged by Tamsin Collison, with music by Chris O'Shaughnessy and produced by Frank Sterling. They are a unique production for Radio 2. This is Christopher Lee wishing you a very good night. <laughs>